Back to the taiga. The rationalistic aspect of Siberia is that a hiker walking in a straight line is always sure to get lost in the forest. If he walks north long enough, his reward will be 2,250,000 square miles of tundra and ice flow that have to be conquered and transformed. But first, they have to be studied. That's the job of Vladimir Melnikov, head of the Low Temperature Institute at Yakutsk. In this climate, winter temperatures can drop to 30 below zero. But it's not for sentimental reasons that Vladimir has an electric fan on his desk. In summer, they climb to 110. In Siberia, the weather jolts you. So do the roads. But cars are insanity when you've got a handy conveyance that suits the terrain to perfection. The reindeer. The entire economy of the Arctic peoples is based upon the reindeer. It serves as wheat, flax, rowboat, Christmas tree, medicine chest, and sacristan, all rolled into one. When gelded, it serves as a horse and is allowed to keep its beautiful satiny antlers, whereas the foolish males cut theirs to ribbons. <laughs> You could go on praising reindeer forever. With those velvet handlebars and the way they have of kicking themselves along with their heels, they're the closest thing to a bicycle that God ever created. If I had the money, I'd shoot a spot commercial in their honor, and I'd run it between two showings, or better still, between two reels. The picture would break off suddenly, and you'd see something like this. We interrupt this film not to sell you some new miracle product, but to remind you of an ancient, irreplaceable product to end all products, reindeer. They make fine pets. They're less of a nuisance than dogs, less intimidating than cats, less insidious than fleas. Reindeer are all these things and more. Are you dissatisfied with your car? Reindeer will transport you. Are you dissatisfied with your tailor? Reindeer will dress you. Are you dissatisfied with your doctor? Reindeer will look after your health. Are you dissatisfied with your interior? Reindeer will redecorate you. Are you dissatisfied with your destiny? Reindeer will bring you luck. And don't forget that for young and for old alike, reindeer are wholesome food, chock full of life-giving chlorophyll. Housewives of the world, wherever you may be, in Moscow, Rome, New York, Peking, or Paris. Beware of imitations such as moose or elk. Always ask for genuine, Reindeer. We followed the reindeer to the Evings camp. Evings, as you all know, are Tunguses. Reindeer and Tunguses have always been associated, but it's a question whether Tunguses like reindeer because they're useful, or whether reindeer like Tunguses because they're light. For centuries, Tunguses and reindeer were nomads together. But now all that's changed. With the wisdom that would have done credit to King Solomon, they've been assigned home bases. They may not show up there for years on end, but they've nevertheless graduated from the dubious category of nomads into the respectable one of householders on the move. Having presented the head of the family with a plastic wallet, a gift which he appreciated all the more as the Arctic world suffers from a serious lack of Woolworth stores, we were treated to the ritual offering of freshly sawed off reindeer antlers.
But don't waste your pity. The operation hurts about as much as trimming fingernails. At least, that's what we were told by the grandfather in Tanguz, by the father in bad Russian, and by the little boy in excellent Russian. For these children, who have inherited their ancestors' bear hunting instincts, go to school and learn trades. This may be a bad sign for the future of bear hunting. As 103-year-old grandfather Inokenti says, bear hunting is for youngsters. When you're over 80, it begins to be dangerous. Because in the days when Inokenti hunted Mishka, the name these people give to every bear, as if there were only one, he was armed with a spear and nothing else. But Inokenti killed that single bear 85 times over. As for Mishka himself, I met him in Yakutsk. Actually, his name was Ushatik, which means little ears, beneath a somewhat moth-eaten exterior due to an overturned samovar when he was little. He was a jovial, rather talkative bear. Boris Sergeyevich found him in the taiga as a baby, and he'd been a member of the family ever since. He was cousin bear. After a breakfast of red berries, Ushatik the bear took his morning walk through Irkutsk. We went with him. Since you can never tell how a bear will react to a camera, we were offered the protection of an armed policeman. But since we're much more frightened of policemen than we are of bears, we politely declined. On our way, we attracted the attention of a group of pioneers who were thrilled to meet a film crew, and even more so when they found out that we were French. Here we met with all the ingredients of the Soviet citizens' incredible and rather touching admiration for our country. One quarter French Revolution, one quarter Zola's novels, one quarter Comédie Française, one quarter Secret Passion for Gay Paris, and four quarters Yves Montand. As I listened to this tribute to Yves Montand, I looked around me. Undeniable energy, enthusiasm, and the will to work. A faith that the future will be as bright as the past was dark. Huge gaps and a firm determination to fill them. While recording these images of the Yakut's capital as objectively as possible, I frankly wondered whom they would satisfy. Because, of course, you can't describe the Soviet Union as anything but the workers' paradise. Or as hell on earth. For example, Yakutsk, capital of the Yakutsk Autonomous Soviet Socialistic Republic, is a modern city in which comfortable buses made available to the population share the streets with powerful Zims, the pride of the Soviet automobile industry. In the joyful spirit of socialist emulation, happy Soviet workers, among them this picturesque denizen of the Arctic reaches, apply themselves to making Yakutsk an even better place to live. Or else, Yakutsk is a dark city with an evil reputation. The population is crammed into blood-colored buses, while the members of the privileged caste brazenly display the luxury of their zims, a costly and uncomfortable car at best. Bending to the task like slaves, the miserable Soviet workers, among them the sinister-looking Asiatic, apply themselves to the primitive labor of grading with a drag beam. Or simply, 
In Yakutsk, where modern houses are gradually replacing the dark, older sections, a bus less crowded than its London or New York equivalent at rush hour passes a Zim, an excellent car reserved for public utilities departments on account of its scarcity. With courage and tenacity under extremely difficult conditions, Soviet workers, among them this Yakut afflicted with an eye disorder, apply themselves to improving the appearance of their city, which could certainly use it. But objectivity isn't the answer either. It may not distort Siberian realities, but it does isolate them long enough to be appraised and consequently distorts them all the same. What counts is the drive and the variety. A walk through the streets of Yakutsk isn't going to make you understand Siberia. What you need might be an imaginary newsreel shot all over Siberia. I might screen it for you in the town's spanking new movie theater, and the commentary would be made up of those Siberian expressions that are already pictures in themselves. The season of dying water is winter. The ghost of the winter hare is snow with its foolhardy flakes. The gray ox that drank all the water in the valley is the frost, which leaves trapped, angry boats behind it. My newsreel would begin with these images of winter, the long white night that lasts half the year. A weather balloon would take you high over the Vekoyansk Mountains, the coldest region on Earth, with a temperature of 92 degrees below zero and a population of 8,000. You'd see huge caterpillars carved out of pebbles by gold mining dredges, You'd see silver birches that look like owl's tracks in the snow. And then, as if someone had gathered up the forest in a giant sheaf, trunk against trunk, and shared it off with cheese wire, you'd see Yakutsk planting its paving stones. You'd see a topsy-turvy world in which houses move to their tenants on sleds. And hunters take live animals into the forest and set them free. A year from now, the hunter of the streams will kill the beaver he's fondling today. A year ago, the trapper of the tundra was playing with the silver fox that he's going to snare. There's not much time to be sentimental over animals whose furs are a natural resource. For centuries past, the country's only one. Actually, there were others, though. Siberia has turned out to have been a poor man sleeping on a mattress stuffed with gold. The problem was how to get at the mattress. And now for the Siberian version of Diamonds Are a Girl's Best Friend. Larisa Papugaeva is a parish of jumping geologist who was dropped into the middle of the taiga in the spring of 1954 to look for a blue layer. After four months spent enduring the unendurable, she made her strike, and they wound up with diamonds. The deposit is richer than any in South Africa. To look for gold, they drown the land. Before the dredges scoop up the ore and carry it away, the kind of firemen, dressed like Nantucket whalers, let fly at the soil with hoses. The real firemen are dressed like aviators. Because when there's a fire in Siberia, it's most likely to be the forest, that other great natural resource that's burning up. And when there's not enough rain to put it out, they make it rain firemen. 